All righty, 11.30. Big group here today. <laughs> so, hey, Richard. How are you, sir? Let me get my bat out, because I'm going to slug it out of the park. How are you? How's everybody doing? So the question is, has anyone read the book besides me? Chloe, have you read the book? I listened to it. Yes, I listened to it too. Rich, have you read the book, Little Black Stretchy Pants? Todd, Josie, have you guys read the book? So, I'm sorry, I was muted. No, okay. I have not. No problem. So I like reading these biographies of these retailers, kind of like when we did Shoe Dog with Nike. Uh, you know, very, very interesting to watch a founder come up with an idea and then play it out and let us see how it's played out across the country into a brand that you know has been on fire for the last i don't know 10 years maybe um, certainly every landlord i know would love to have a lululemon in their shopping center so uh, the guy uh chip wilson uh, was a very quirky founder uh you know, when I was listening to the book when I was doing my bike ride and on page two, like literally two or three minutes into the book, he starts talking about, um, what's a uh, uh, landmark and how he requires all of his, how he required all of his employees to take the landmark class, which uh, for those of you that don't know what Landmark is, um, it is the successor to, back in the 70s, there was an organization called EST, e -S -T. and um, has anyone on the call done any Landmark classes or been involved at all in any Landmark or EST uh, programs? So, uh, it... Have you, Sean? You haven't, right, Sean? Oh. So um, if you Google landmark, it'll say, "Are is it a cult or not? So that just gives you, like, that, that's all I'm going to say about it. So I'm, I'm listening to this book. I have now made it part of the book club. And I'm literally two minutes into the audio where he says, I require all of my employees to take a landmark class. And I was like, oh, this, this is going to be interesting. Where is this going to go? So I was very happy and um, comforted by the fact that that didn't really play into the book as much as I thought it was going to. Because I I, if, if it would have gone down that path, I probably would have switched up the book. So that, was, that, so that was my first intro to the book. And I remember calling my friend going, you know, do you know anything about Chip Wilson and Lululemon, like this whole landmark thing? And she's like, no, you know. So, so anyway, it it then does not it's it does not become an issue in the book. He does bring it up multiple times, and he does when he starts bringing in later on in the book um, leadership, right? Where he's bringing in partners and he's raising money and. There's new presidents that he brings in to replace him, you know, when they don't, and partners and all these varying businesses, whenever they don't buy into his idea, which is predicated on the landmark forum, it's an issue for him. So uh, it does play in like that. And he's very attached, obviously, and committed to the whole landmark thing. And again, I don't know anything about landmark. You know, I, I would I would put it in the column of the controversy of um, Scientology. Again, I don't know anything about landmark or Scientology. 
All I do know is that they're both controversial topics and <laughs> I was very surprised two minutes into the audio where he starts talking about this. But like I said, he moves on and he is a, a very interesting character to the point in the beginning where he is always thinking ahead and understanding trends years before that they happen. And, um, and you know, he, always, he says, I've always been early. I'm always predicting things. And then I can't get the world to, um, to come along with me. I can't raise the money. And then three or four years later, Nike or someone else comes behind me and, and you know, takes, and that does, doesn't take the, their idea, but catches up. So um, I found that fascinating. You know, I, I deal a lot with, with founders of companies that grow their companies to a level where then they say they, they have a founder syndrome. You know, they, they, they have an idea, they build their company, but they're not the guy or the gal to scale it. And then that's when they either start raising money, they bring in professional leadership, and there's always conflicts between the founders and professional leadership. And that is through the book. You know, he gets taken advantage of early where he sells parts of the company, different parts of different companies and gets taken advantage of. And then even at the end where the Lululemon board kicks him off the board um, and, you know, and then brings them back because they can't, you know, they don't do a good job. And you, you hear stories like that, like with Apple, right? Same thing with Apple. But, um, you know, so very, a guy that's out there, you know, wearing shorts to work, you know, 20 years ago when no one was doing that, showing up at meetings with shorts. He was into the skateboard community. Uh, he, was, he was selling um, jackets to the snowboarding community and, and going to the ski resorts and convincing them to put uh, uh, very colorful and oversized jackets for the snowboarding community when the ski community was like kicking them out of their offices. So th this guy was, you know, just tell me no and I'm gonna figure out a way. So that, that was a testament to his determination and his belief in his ideas and he always had this idea that women wanted, he, you know, his goal was to create a product that women would go to coffee in. That, and he, he, he said that the big firms like Nike and Under Armour, their idea to outfit women in athletic apparel was shrink it and pink it. <laughs> I love that. So he said that, Nike's idea to outfit women in exercise apparel was shrink it and pink it because up until Lululemon, right, there was no form fitting athletic apparel. They were all baggy sweatpants and baggy, you know, hoodies. And he said, I know that I can make women look good and feel good. And he was a runner and he um, and, and always did all kinds of exercises. And he believed and, and would work tirelessly with manufacturers and seamstresses and, and creators of garments to try to find the garment. He said, I want the athletic, the, the, the woman who was his, his avatar client to put on you know, the pants and feel like they're part of her skin and that would breathe. So if she perspired while she was running or doing yoga or whatever, that, um, that it wasn't th that the, the, the perspiration didn't, you know, stick with it, that it was a breathable material and he obsessed over it. I think, I think in the book, they, they talked about that it took him three to five years to find the material and that he was obsessed with that. All while he was trying, he was doing his skateboarding business and his snowboarding business. So um, they finally, they get the material. They have this great relationship with uh, the seamstress and this company, I think in Japan, it was so similar to the whole shoe dog book that we read six months ago with what, what Nike went through. And then they decide to open their first store you know, fascinating for us real estate people. 
and they opened it up on a second floor. Like, <laughs> like there's no way, like no one knew, but what he did was he worked the yoga teachers. So he took the product and he went to the yoga studios and he, he and people, his marketing young ladies, and they would wear the product and he would give some product to the yoga teachers. And it was a word of mouth marketing campaign. And, but finally, I think he said after two years of this second floor location, and then they would have yoga. And then when he realized, okay, this is a terrible location, no one even knows about us. They had these A-frame signs on the sidewalk, but they had to, someone had to go up the stairs in this retail street. He said um, they started having yoga classes in the retail store, which you know, at till today, I was in a mall back in February somewhere in around the country. I don't remember where. And in front of it was inside of a mall, and in front of the Lululemon store. It's, it was a Sunday afternoon. I was in there on Sunday and it said yoga class in the back of the store at four o'clock today. So they're still doing that, which I think is a phenomenal idea. Um, so they've started doing yoga classes in the store. And he also had in the store, the seamstresses. And one of their early things, I don't think they do this anymore. Um, one of the early things they used to do is they had seamstresses in the stores. So if you had shorter legs or longer legs or whatever, if you bought the Lululemon pants, you could immediately have them tailored. So I thought that was, and that was a huge thing for many, many years. I'm not sure if they still do that. I have to, I, I have been in a Lululemon store to buy something once. I had <laughs> a lot of stuff on the counter. I had no idea the prices. And when I got the final tally, I was shocked at how expensive it was. But, and he talks about this in his whole, in the whole book that he would women pay a certain price, triple the price of a competitive garment if they knew it's, that it was long lasting. And he believed that women would, and obviously he was right, right? And he obviously was right that they would then eventually it would become this tribe, he calls it a tribe, and they would go to coffee in his clothing. Um, the, the story of the logo was great. So they, they had to get a logo done, um, and they, I think they put it out to a, a bunch of different people. His kids got involved in the logo, and then they finally created the logo, they picked it, and, um, and they decided and, and now you know you've seen this to not put the word not put lululemon on the storefronts to just have the logo and he said i felt that just having the logo was more powerful and then and then the whole bag thing was a big deal so the bag thing i don't you know the bags the lululemon bags i think they're red and black and white had all of these words and these sayings and these quotes all over them and um and in the beginning, they were outlandish. The quotes were outlandish. And as he started raising money, and then became, you know, the company became public, the um, leadership, the professional leadership, took the the more interesting quotes off the bags. And you know, that that's you know when and we've seen this right. We've seen where retailers form these great companies and then they bring in private equity and then it, it you know many many times destroys the heart of the company right and the uniqueness we've seen that so and i think that 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 took a lot out of this guy i don't know has any you know they him and his wife he and his wife have started another company and i think they're still involved i have never been in this store has anyone been in a kit and ace store k i t ACE. Has anyone been in a kit and a store on the call? I don't know. I, I think they have about 20, 20 to 25 of them. So the wife, when they, once they were getting eased out after they went public, the wife went to Lululemon. She's, it's, it's a cashmere feel of casual wear for women. And they took it to Lululemon and they said, we have created this garment we think this is the next thing. And Lululemon 
told them they, they didn't want it. That, you know, and, and, that, and that it was a conflict of interest and she, the wife was still working at the company and they basically edged her out because she was working on this other new garment and they thought it would be a conflict and out she went. So now I think they have 20, I think I looked, after I finished reading the book, I, I went online and Googled them and they have like 20 or 25 stores, but I, I have not been in one. He said, um, and he was very, the whole book, he talked about the push to do the vertical model of manufacturing and going straight to retail and not having a, dis, uh, a distributor in the middle. That was the, a big thing. And at the time that he was doing it, no one was doing it. Now, you know, we're seeing more people do that. But back then, when they first started, you know, and, and he got a ton of, you um, people not buying into that, like just him being different, wanting to do something different. The, the money that he saved in controlling that process was unbelievable. And, and now, you know, many, many other people are doing it. He, he talked a lot in the book about Atlas Shrugged. So this is very funny. So while I'm reading the book, this is about the first week that I'm doing the bike thing. So for those of that you, for those of you that, you that don't know, in July I did some, I joined this thing called the Calendar Club Challenge, and the Calendar Club Challenge is you pick something to do every day of the month of the date of the calendar. So on the on August, you know, on July first, I rode one mile on my bike, and on July thirty first, I rode thirty one miles. And I'm not a biker. This was kind of a big deal to commit to this, so I did it. So I the the this book was the book that I started with. And while I'm listening to this book, he's talking about Atlas Shrugged. And, and, and he's saying that Atlas Shrugged was a book that kind of formed his whole uh, thesis on capitalism and running a company and creating a brand and all of this stuff. And I've always wanted to read Atlas Shrugged, but every time I've sat down and picked up Atlas Shrugged and seeing how many pages it was, it was like, I could never get through chapter one. So after I finished this book and I'm thinking I've got, you know, two and three hours a day of bike riding, I'm excited. I'm going to get to listen to a lot of books. I figured I would do, I would do Atlas Shrugged. So I did read Atlas Shrugged right after this book. And it was a very interesting book to read. Who has, who has read Atlas Shrugged? Anyone on the call read at, have read Atlas Shrugged by Anne Rand? Nobody. It is, um, it is so strange, this story about how a government takes over and control, like all, all to, to like the nth of the degree of communism. And the whole time I'm reading this book and this whole socialistic, you know, literally the week I was reading this book, you had Apple and Microsoft and Google and, and uh, Facebook you know, in these hearings in front of our government. It was like, it was just surreal. But, um, but Atlas Shrugged is a very interesting book. It's a fiction book and it makes you really think. It, so I, I could never read it. I, I don't think I could ever get through it, but listening to it, it was 11 hours of listening. So, it, but it was interesting. So if you've ever wanted to read it, um, now is a good time with, you know, what's going on in our country. So, so anyway, he was between Landmark Forum and Atlas Shrugged, those were his kind of guiding principles. And that was very interesting as he's founding and formulating and creating this retail company that like, I know, I don't know one landlord that would not want a Lululemon in their properties, right? So um, very, very fascinating. Especially if you see this, the picture of this guy, you would never connect this guy being the founder of Lululemon. So he was obsessed with quality and he 100% he believed that people would pay three and four times if you had the quality. Uh, so that, so that I, I, and I think that that's so true. And I was having a conversation this morning with someone where we were talking about that. How much more will people pay for double or triple the service 
or double or triple the quality of the product. What do you guys think about that? What do you think the difference is, the markup between quality and price? Sean, what do you think? Yeah, I think you definitely probably have a, uh, an advantage, like if you're having a really good quality and the service is high level. Is that what you're referring to? Because I think that would uh, trump like a lot of the other brands, like if, if they're not really at that same level. Like I find like there's that store in, um, in downtown Disney. I'm not sure what it's called, but it's like an Asian store. I don't know if you've been to it. I don't know if someone on the call knows it, but it's similar because it kind of gives you that experience when you go there. And it's like this mega store and it has that, just that feeling. And one of the things I got from the book that I liked is that he seemed like he put educators on the floor and he called them educators. Right. And that even if there was another brand that was better for the client, they would recommend maybe go to another store because that might be more, more important for the customer satisfaction. So I think I like that. And I think I would rather go to a store and pay more for that. Yeah, he, he def, yeah he def, all of the people that worked in the store had to be educated. He said, he said, people aren't going to understand. And this was me. This was me. Like before I read the book, you know, I was very happy wearing, you know, shrink it and pink it Nike and Under Armour for my whole life. Like, I don't care. I, I'm not a big, you know, clothing person. Uh, so I walk in the store. Now, today's different, right? 20 years later. But in the early days, he said, I need an educator on the floor that's going to sell the product because the educator needs to convince the woman about like the seams, all these little things that he did to make the pants, which was initially, it was just pants. Initially, they own, that's little black stretchy pants. So initially they only sold the pants and then they added all of the other garments later and then now men's you know, apparel, but um, they said that when the person walks in the store, the, the clerk needs to be able to say, the reason these pants are $150 is, and that they really need to understand the garment, the stitching, the breathable material, on and on and on, which again, back then was highly unusual that you had someone in a store knowing that amount of knowledge about the material of the product they're selling. But, you know, it worked for him, right? It worked for them. Um, the, he also was huge about the 360s, right? Where everyone reviewed everybody, you know, and, and everyone had an open and an honest dialogue about strengths and weaknesses. And that probably goes back to his landmark forum you know, experience. And um, he was very big about that at all levels of the store. And then late, later on in the corporate part of the business, et cetera. Um, and he also, and I think this is so true, you know, today th there's the theme riches is in the riches are in the niches. And he, he, many times people would come to him and want him to add different products and he was very, very careful to stay narrow. He believed in staying narrow, completely aligning with his brand, with the quality and with the pricing. And as they grew and as they had different leadership come in, things changed. And then, you know, at, at some point the stock dropped you know, he went to Australia for two year, a year or two years. They brought him back. Um, you know, very, very interesting, which is, again, back to the whole thing of retailers who end up selling and then, you know, private equity groups come in, start running the companies. They're not retailers. They're, they don't care about being narrow. They don't care about quality. They don't care about educators on the floor. And then uh, the companies start to have major, major problems, right? Um, Geneva, you're going to jump in. Did you read the book? I, I know you are a Lululemon customer. She's probably with her grandchildren and is not going to speak up. Tom, did you read the book? Unmute. Okay. Um, I did not read the book. I'm familiar with the stores. 
I do shop there from time to time because of the quality. I thought that it was interesting. My takeaway on it, um, I can turn my video on. Sorry about the thing. But um, my takeaway on it, uh, since the pandemic, if you will, the quality is there, but you could tell they had some big supply chain uh, problems getting product from China. So shelves are pretty empty. The customer centric service was pretty gone. They were um, one of the more conservative retailers in terms of letting customers in. You're probably familiar with the store down here in Fort Lauderdale on Federal. You know, I had to stand outside to get in. The staff was not very nice about it. They were okay once you were in the store. Um, but, uh, you know, they didn't know when their product was coming back in. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, a little cocky uh, versus being accommodative in the situation, which I thought was not going to help them out long term, especially when they don't have product. And then shortly after that, uh, I saw they missed their numbers in a big way, too. So, you know, I, maybe more of a culture thing that they didn't adapt, you know, for the changes in the society like they should have or could have. And if they can't, they can understand supply chain problems. But, you know, at least be nice to the customers to try to get them back or offer them a coupon or some type of, you know, incentive to have them revisit when products back in stock. One other thing that shocked me is they were collecting my data um, you know, email address, phone number for their point systems club, you know, much like, uh, you know, Tommy Bahama does in the container store that actually use that data in a very proactive way. And obviously us being a retail, we, we catch on that and we like, okay, you know, what, what promos we're going to get, you know, what type of customer are they pulling after and attracting? Are they pushing it to online? Do they have a true omni channel? And I really expected Lululemon to be on top of those things. And I asked the, the salesperson, I said, oh, am I going to get offers? Am I, you know, going to, you know, be kind of selected when there's things going on that I'll get a call about for promotions like uh, Ralph and Polo would do? And they said, no, we don't do that. I'm like, well, why am I giving you my data? For what purpose? You know, so anyway, th there's a few things that really disappointed me. You know, to answer your question, yes, you pay more for the experience and the quality of the product. But if the uh, if the shell is empty, when you know when you look into it, then it's something you kind of remember. And you know, is it really worth it? You know, in the long term, and will I be standing in line to get into a Lululemon store? Maybe not. What what, what percentage was the store empty? Well, they were, they were controlling it. Uh, I would say well, I mean, it was about- I meant from a merchandise standpoint because of the shipping. Um, probably about, well, you know, Lululemon is not necessarily what's percentage. It's more if everything is extra large that's on the shelves. And to be honest, you know, extra large people is not going to be their first stop, you know? Um, so in terms of product that you could actually utilize, I would say it was probably about uh, 50 to 60 percent. Shelves were stocked to about 80 percent. You know, in stores like that, you can re-merchandise and put more distance right. between shelves you, and stuff. You get the ABC pants. Uh, I did not get those. I just got shorts. You know, you I know, changed my wardrobe four times in the last two years. You know. <laughs> Do you know what the ABC pants stands for? I don't know. Mm -mm. Okay, so. I don't want to be. Uh, <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Go ahead, Beth. <laughs> it's We're anti recording YouTube, so whatever. <laughs> okay. Right. So it's 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 for guys, and it's uh -huh. called the anti bee crushing pants. You guys can fill up the <laughs> on the bee. And <laughs> and they and when he before he was public, they marketed that. They said, these are the ABC pants for guys, and they put it out there, and the minute he went public, they stopped that. Yeah, now they call it if it has a liner or no liner. That's how they market it now. So Geneva, I've got to believe that you are a huge Lululemon fan with the amount of oh, exercising you Can you, you see did. my pants I have on today? Are, those, <laughs> are they Lulus? These are Lulus, baby. There you go. Uh, so yes. Um, I am, and, and actually I bought about four pair of ABC pants for um, family for Christmas this past year, so they are back. Um, 
and I love everything about Lululemon. Our store has plenty of inventory, unlike the neighbor across the street called Vineyard Vines that looks like they're going out of business because they have about 25% inventory is all they have. This is in Jacksonville, but um, Lulu seems to have had plenty of stock, and yes, you do have to wait. It's like, what is that line for? I'm just going into the Lululemon store, and it's like, oh, that's the Lululemon line. Moves pretty quickly. The staff is very helpful. I kind of go in there knowing what I'm looking for, and if they have it, I buy it. If they don't, I leave. It's not a big deal. So, How long have you been a customer? Oh, since they opened in Jacksonville. So that's probably been, they were in about the third phase of St. John's Town Center. So probably eight or nine years. Were you, did you know about them before you saw the store? No, I didn't know anything about them. But they, so the Jacksonville store, my son owns a um, CrossFit gym in Jacksonville Beach and they pick different gyms and yoga studios and uh, Pilates classes to be what they call their ambassadors. Right. And so I can, every time I go in there, I get to tell somebody that's my son's picture up on the wall. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. Yeah. But they're, they've always had a really good, um, strong business in Jacksonville. In fact, they've just opened one down in Ponte Vedra, which is unheard of. Um, no national retailers go down because the market is so small and people who aren't living in Ponte Vedra never need to go there. So that's kind of an interesting move. So how much do you, what percentage of your wardrobe is Lululemon? My workout gear? How much, let, let me ask you this. What percentage of your wardrobe is workout gear? Um, during COVID, 50%. And of, the fit, of that workout gear, how much percentage is Lululemon? Of my bottoms, 100%. Of wow. my tops, probably 30%. And is it, is it, um, do you feel like it's a second skin? Like what he wanted to, what he wanted to create was a second skin. Um, I've never really, let me, let me feel it. Let me see if I can, <laughs> it feels like a second skin. Yeah. You know, yeah. he also created, he created a pant where it's lower in the front for women and higher in the back. Did you know that? Well, that's probably why, like in Pilates class, you're not having to look at women's cracks. Right. Exactly. Because, of, because of being twisting and on, you know, and you're, you know what I mean, so. And he, all, he said that they spent over two or three years trying to get rid of camel toe. <laughs> <laughs> and that that was a huge goal for him because that's why women would not wear workout clothes to coffee and that he knew that if he could solve that problem women would wear what workout clothes to coffee okay well i guess in some instances if they're bought at the proper size you eliminate that if you think you're a size four and you're really a size eight you might still create that look <laughs> <laughs> so you um did, did you read the book? I didn't, but I've enjoyed listening to you today. I will. It, it, so. he, he's a weird, he's, he's very, I just like, I think it's so interesting for us in the retail world to hear these stories from when he, you know, from when he was the skateboard guy and then the snowboard guy. I mean, you just hear this story about this visionary and how, you know, uh, boardrooms were shutting their doors on him and it just gives so much hope and optimism to uh, those of us that get those calls you know like you know some of you have heard my famous blockbuster video story where he calls and I go no I, I think that's a stupid idea a 6,000 square foot video store <laughs> click so we <laughs> leasing agents have opportunities to get those calls from those startup retailers and some of them turn out to be Lululemons and Blockbuster videos, right? Yep, they do. For so, sure. Well, well, thanks for participating, Miss Geneva. Well, thank you for doing it. It's been a great book. I think Kristen's in her office and I've got my iPad up loud enough that she's heard the whole thing. So uh, interesting story. An elderly friend of ours 
um, lost his wife this past year and he had gone out with a bunch of young people or younger people on a boating ride one afternoon during COVID with social distancing and all of that. And later that evening we were having dinner with him and he goes, gosh, let me tell you something. I have found my newest favorite clothes for women. And it's like, your newest favorite clothes for women. He goes, yeah, when Gary was alive, she never wore this stuff, but it's called Lululemon. You should see what these gals look like wearing this Lululemon, these Lululemon outfits. It was so funny. So I sent him your book club information. So I'm going to get him the book to read because he was just fascinated by it. And, and he's, he's a real estate guru. He's been in the industry forever, but on the office side of things. But it was just so cute. Have you ever heard of Lululemon? It's like, what part of the earth have you lived on for the past <laughs> 10 years? <laughs> well, he will, he will love the book because if he's in real estate, I mean, the, the, mach, the machinations this guy goes through when he's getting the bids from, you know, buying companies. So when he decides that he's going to take Lululemon uh, public, um, before that, they were raising money like a Series C or A or whatever. And he actually, the gap comes to meet him. And the story about the gap coming to meet him and then um, offering him a number that was like stupid low. And he, and, he, and he believed that the gap would have been the good purchase. And I think also Under Armour came to and did a pitch. And then Gap turns around and takes the information and goes yeah. and does Athleta, mm -hmm. right? And steals, yep. I mean, that these it's so interesting to hear these stories of these founders who literally make so many mistakes but mm -hmm. but continue to plod plot along plot along figure it out um you know reach out get advice sometimes and then you're listen i listen to my books because i was writing and you you just and you're hearing going oh don't do that oh don't it's kind of like the scary movie don't go up the stairs to the attic don't you know you're screaming, like um and then but then come out uh, you know and, and in the same thing when we we read shoe dog you know nike i had no idea that Nike, I mean, just like Nike, Lululemon should have probably filed bankruptcy 15 times. You know, yep. Nike, Nike was on the brink 15, 20, 30 times. And it's just the testament of the uh, relentless persistence to keep, you know, just, you know, go another day. Like that was what I was thinking when I was riding my bike. It's only one more mile than yesterday. <laughs> just got to keep going and because you know it's it's like that cartoon the guy in the backyard where he there's two guys in the backyard and they both have shovels and they're both digging and the guy quits you know and he's, and he's away from the gold in the in you know in the in the backyard like so you know love the book love the book and i you know and i like just reading about retail you know we so many times we re read Last, like last week, we, I mean, last month we read the, um, what was the one we read last week? Uh, Babylon, The Richest Man of, of Babylon, which was a fascinating book, which was a hundred year old book. And then right in the middle of COVID, we, I switched it up and did Man's Search for Meaning, which was a heavy, heavy duty book. But for everything that we were all going through, it was a great book to read so that we knew, okay, what we're going through is really nothing. And, you know, we just, you know, can all have a different perspective. Next month, mm -hmm. uh, I've been posting and writing about, this is probably one of the best books, the best motivating books I have ever read. Can't hurt me. I listened to it and now I bought the book. I'm going to reread it and write things. I mean, this got, thank God I picked this up book up the last week when I was doing the 26 miles, the 27 miles, the 28 miles, this guy talked me through my last week of bike riding. <laughs> Phenomenal. I mean, next, next month's book was supposed to be um, The Alchemist, because this was going to be, be the year we went back in time and read some of these old traditional um, novels. So I, I, I bumped The Alchemist and I'm adding in Can't Hurt Me because I have 
I've read hundreds and hundreds of books. This guy, this guy, listen to the audio. You're going to, he reaches through the audio and drags you to do things you never thought you would do. It, hmm. It's phenomenal. So you guys can't hurt me. Start reading it or listening to it now. The one really good, good thing about the listening to the book was um, the guy who wrote it for him, or so David, I guess, wrote it, but he had a ghostwriter guy. What's his name? I don't know. It's, it's not here. The guy who co-wrote it with him reads the book, reads the audio book. And what they do after every few chapters, uh, they have a podcast. So you get David, the guy, and the audio reader, and they talk about, like they kind of, you know, the, the reader goes, oh my gosh, David, so blah, blah, what about that? And they have this little dialogue, which you're not getting when you read the book. So I highly recommend listening to the book. So that's next month's. So I, I bumped The Alchemist. So what else? Michael Hinton, are you available to speak up and tell us what you think about all of this? Or are you not available? Todd, I see you, Todd. Did you read the book? I didn't know about the book, but I'll try and do the audio on the next one. Can you hear me? Yes, definitely, yes. definitely do the audio on the yeah. next one. I, I'm a newbie and I'll I know. This try is to participate. Great. You're a Virgin um, Book Club member. Huh? You're a Virgin Book Club member. At 66, it feels good to be a virgin. <laughs> <sighs> and to listen to women talk about camel toe. I'm reaching new heights in my life. <laughs> Brooke, did you read the book? I did. I listened to it on Audible. What did you think? I felt so bad for him. I felt like he just kept on getting like screwed over and screwed over and like nobody had his back. And then, I mean, it really was something where like he kept on going to these people and like asking for advice and they were just all pointing him in like the way wrong direction and like nobody was on the same wavelength as him. And I mean, I was not a Lululemon fan. Um, I had a couple of friends who were, I did a half marathon last year and it was the first one. And they were like, you have to start wearing like different running gear. Like, you know, everybody was swearing by it. I was primarily like an old Navy leggings type of gal. So I was like, oh my gosh, fine. I'll try them. So I tried them out and I was like, these suck. They like roll up. I don't like running in pants, I like running in shorts. So all my friends were like, you need to just go back into the store and like talk to them about it. So I went back in, they were like, oh, you know, you have the wrong size, blah, blah, blah. And one of the issues that he had talked about wanting to fix was, you know, them also kind of being kind of see-through, especially for like yoga and everything when you bend over and, it, you know, gets tighter on your behind and, that, and stuff of it being see-through. So I went into the store and they were like, oh, you know, let's try on these, let's try on that, like super friendly. So I was like, okay, I'm a fan. But even with the ones that I have, I have a pair of running shorts and then I have two pairs of their longer leggings. And I have to say though, I'm an Athleta fan now. I've been more on board with Athleta and I think that their pricing is a, little, is a little bit better and I've found that they're a little bit better quality. So I still like Lululemon every now and then I'll pop in there and purchase something. But when it comes to like my primary training gear and stuff, I tend to go with Athleta. But um, you know, I mean, I think it's a great story as a retail leasing broker. I mean, I'd love to have Lululemon in all of my shopping centers and stuff like that. But I mean, listening to the book and stuff, I mean, the guy jumped over every imaginable hurdle and his end goal in mind was always the customer and quality, which you just have to respect. But, um, yeah, I mean, I just, like I said, he just kept getting screwed over and, even, right. weren't you, aren't you, weren't you going, don't go to that guy. Like, right. Yes. They're like screaming. Yeah. But I, I mean, you know, I bought the pants, but I didn't buy the tight pants Geneva has. I bought the loose pants and they, they have prickly things inside. Like they, like they, they like, they hurt my legs. And Chloe said, you got to go in there to the store. They'll exchange them. And yeah. I'm like, all right. But I'm, you know, but I do think that now that he's out and you know, this is a thing with retail. They get big, they get professional leadership that is not headed by retail people and it dilutes 
what he wanted. And that's exactly what, you know, what Tom said, where they were rude to him. The, I mean, Chip would be rolling over in his grave if he heard that. And the yeah. same thing with you, like he fought hard so that they weren't see-through, right? They've, you know, all this stuff. But um, I am so proud that you did a marathon. You are going to love- oh, no, 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 half marathon. Okay. I don't care. <laughs> I can't even run a block, let alone a mile. And Geneva's a runner or and walker. This next book, you are not going to believe this next book, how phenomenal this next book is. Yeah, I have that one downloaded on Audible too. I just haven't started it Do you it send out emails on the book, what the next book is? It's. I'm telling you the book is called, I'm telling you right now, they will send out emails, but you got, they'll send out emails later and it'll be too late. You won't be able to finish. The book is Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins and how I found him. So Josie and I went two years ago to the Grant Cardone 10X Challenge conference. So we're sitting there and it's, an all, it's three days of speakers, Josie and me and Kara. And Jesse Itzler gets up, who's Sarah Blakely, who owns Spanx, who by the way, she's now doing workout pants, Spanx. I haven't bought any of those either. So Jesse gets up and, and does this unbelievable speech I fall in love with Jesse and I get Living with a Seal, which is a book where he meets this guy, David Goggins, in uh, one of these running races, a hundred mile running races. And the guy has like a chair and a couple of cheese crackers and a couple of bottles of water. It's a hundred mile race. He's like broken all of his toes and his bones and his feet. And he like finishes the race. And Jesse Itzler says, I got to meet this guy. And he flies to California to meet David Goggins, the seal. And he goes, I want you to come back to Atlanta and li or I guess maybe they lived in New York. I want you to come live with my family in for a month. So that book, which we've done in the book club, whenever six months ago, loved that book. And everyone kept telling me, if you love that book, you're gonna really love the Seals book, which is David Goggins. And I kept putting it off. And I, but I'm so glad, I so believe in timing is everything because there is not a book in the world. I don't, do not think I would have finished the Calendar Club Challenge riding those last hundred miles if this guy was not in my ear. I, I don't think, so I think timing is everything. And I think, you know, cause people have been telling me to read this book for a year cause I was so in love with the Jesse Itzler book which was about this guy. So I'm so excited for next month and I'm gonna reread the book and I never reread, you know, I never, I listen to the book, we have the book club. If it helps some people, great. This time I love the book. So I'm gonna try to get them on the call is what I'm gonna try to do. So everyone keep your fingers crossed because I would love to have him on the call. I just think he's an unbelievable human, this guy. So that's going to be my goal between now and the next month's book club, which, Josie, do you have a date for the next month's book club? I believe, let me confirm in a few seconds, but I believe it's September 18th. Um, and Chloe said they do, they still do free hemming, which is great. So if so, if you want to read about a retailer, this is obviously one of the hottest retailers in our world. It's a story of persistence, like Brooke said, like no other. Like this one in Shoe Dog. Brooke, did you read Shoe Dog? Yeah, and I could definitely see a lot of the parallels between the two books. Of just, <laughs> I feel like the same thing with Phil Knight. Like, he wanted to make a really good running shoe, and he wanted it to be quality. He wanted it like. <laughs> His end goal was the consumer, again, just how Chip Wilson was. But one of the things, too, that I really liked about um, both of them is their family perspective with it and how they could figure out ways to kind of bring their family involved or, like, kind of balancing with all of that. I mean, I'm single. I don't have any kids. I have two dogs, so I can't really relate to the whole work-life balance as, you know, some folks can, but... I thought it was really interesting too to hear about how his perspective kind of changed too with the different companies both of like the snowboarding both product actually, stuff. Actually, you know, both Phil Knight and and Chip Wilson, both of them had kids like early on, weren't good parents, and then later on got their kids involved, right? That was true yeah. in both of them. But I mean, I, I was shocked 
at how many problems Nike had. I had no yeah. idea. This is yeah. why reading is so great, right? Um, okay, so Josie, uh, what's the date for the next one? Sorry, I put it in the chat, September 25th. So September 25th, and it's Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Uh, I, you know, everyone knows my, the best book of the four years of the book club. We've been doing this, Todd, four years, this book wow. club. Um, the best book ever was Never Split the Difference. Everyone, it's, it, that book is on the, the number one book that we've ever done on all of the book clubs. I am telling you that Can't Hurt Me beats Never Split the Difference, beats it, in my opinion. Now, maybe it's because I personally was going through the bike ride and you're just not gonna believe what this guy does, that, what this guy puts his body through and, and how this guy overcomes. Who's the author on Never Split the Difference? Who's the author is um, Chris. C-H or C-R? Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, V-O-S-S. -S. Yes. And is that Chris with an H or just C-R? C-H. With an H. Yeah, C-H-R-I-S. But so Todd and everyone on the call, because I think also um, Kirsten, Kristen is uh, a virgin today too, maybe, but all of the book club calls for the last four years are on the website. All of these calls are recorded and they're on the website. So you can listen to this, this like little, uh, you know, Cliff Notes version of the book. And we've had authors on past books. We had Gary Vaynerchuk on Crushing It. We had Grant Cardone on the 10X Rule. We had Jeb Blunt. We, we interviewed the guy that did the rejection, 90 Days of Rejection. That was a fun, very funny book. And, and that was a great author. So um, yeah, so keep your fingers crossed. I'm gonna try to get this guy for our call next month. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Listen, you might have to give me a month to catch up with you guys because I'm I'm really uh, buried in a bunch of stuff, but I'll try. You don't have to read the book to be part of the book club. Okay. Very few people read the book. They just call and listen to me. All right, guys. And I definitely thanks, recommend guys. doing like the audibles and yeah, stuff too, so like thanks, in the Beth. car and stuff. But yeah, I found it a lot easier to do the audibles because some of them, when I go to read them, I mean, the content is good, but it's not the way that you typically digest a book. So I found that listening to them is a, a lot easily, um, I finish them a lot more frequently if I listen to it versus reading it. Me too, 100%. Yeah. 100%. That's why be, in the beginning of COVID, I was jonesing. I like, I and I yeah. was like, I need to drive so I can start. And that's the bike thing worked out great because I was able to substitute the driving for the biking. Yeah. All right, guys. Have a great day. We'll talk Thank to you later. You, you owe me a phone call, Beth. Thank you, Beth. Appreciate Thank everything. You. I'll call you, Todd. I'll call you.